Hi, I'm Richard McKenzie, co-author of Microeconomics for uh, MBAs. This video module is going to be about the demand for uh, network goods. A network good is uh, some good, the value which is influenced by how many other people are consuming uh, the good. Uh, if you have a uh, fax machine and you're the only person to have a fax machine, then that machine is not very valuable uh, to you. Uh, the reason is that you're not able to fax any one uh, document. But if other people have fax machines, then uh, the value of your particular fax machine is, uh, can be greatly increased. The greater the number of other fax machines that are bought by other people, uh, the greater the value of your fax machine. Similarly, uh, it has been argued that operating systems uh, represent network goods. If a few people buy um, a Windows operating system, uh, then those, um, those buyers can get some value uh, out of the windows uh, that, they, that they buy. But if a lot of other people uh, acquire a uh, windows operating system, then the value of any one individual's uh, uh, windows operating system uh, goes up for two reasons. One is they can communicate with other computer users. Secondly, with uh, a lot of people using windows, then uh, application developers can be expected uh, to write for windows. Uh, which can increase the value of Windows. And if uh, there are more applications, you'll find more people buying uh, Windows. With more people buying Windows, more application developers can, um, can write for Windows, and you can have an escalating uh, demand uh, for uh, Windows. Now, the network good stands in sharp contrast with the demand for a standard good uh, that uh, is considered in microeconomics everywhere. Uh, as we have uh, discussed in here, uh, the demand for a standard good, uh, say a candy bar, is one in which the quantity that's actually uh, demanded uh, in the marketplace is unaffected by how many other people are consuming uh, the particular uh, candy bar. If I, if I eat a Snickers candy bar, I'm not especially concerned with how many other people are eating Snickers candy bars at, at that time. So... Um, Consumers are willing to pay uh, price P1 for quantity uh, Q1, and the quantity Q1 will not stimulate uh, demand uh, in the future. If you lower the price from P1 to P2, the quantity demanded will go up, and, and so on and, and so forth. There's no reason uh, to extend the demand curve down into the uh, negative range or negative quadrant uh, simply because for a standard type good, it makes no sense for producers to charge uh, a negative price. That is, they would be paying people uh, to uh, buy, uh, buy the good. And the reason is that this greater consumption does not stimulate uh, uh, demand uh, in, the, in the future. And since marginal costs are always positive, it's always good to have uh, prices that are in the uh, positive quadrant. For example, if the marginal cost is, is MC1, uh, the appropriate price would be, would be uh, P2. For uh, network goods, however, the, the analysis takes, takes on a different uh, uh, line of argument. That is, in a network good, you can have a price of a P1, and with that price, you can have a quantity that is going to be demanded. And the producer can, in fact, consider lowering uh, the price. But in the case of network goods, if the quantity demanded uh, goes up because the price uh, goes up, then indeed the uh, demand for the good uh, can go up. Why? Because with more, uh, with more uh, units being consumed, uh, in the case of Windows, there would be more applications uh, written for Windows, and as a result, uh, the value of Windows uh, goes up, and in uh, future time periods, the quantity demanded can, in fact, uh, go to uh, Q3. Uh, Lower the price even, even more to P3, and that is, in today's uh, time period, the quantity demanded may go to uh, Q4. Uh, but that greater quantity can stimulate even more applications being uh, written for the network good, Windows uh, operating system, and as a consequence, uh, the demand curve uh, can go up uh, by even more uh, in, the, 
in the future. This is D2, D3. The result is, in the future, the price can go to um, uh, Q5. Uh, Moral of the story is that, there, that with uh, changes in the price from P1 to P2 to P3, uh, you actually have a long-run uh, demand curve uh, that's uh, different from these uh, short-run curves that I have here. And the long-run curve can look uh, something like this. That is, uh, producers can indeed uh, think of themselves as having a long-run demand curve uh, equal uh, to that uh, curve uh, there. Under, the, uh, under a network good, it can make sense to, in fact, uh, charge a zero price because a zero price can, in fact, lead to a greater quantity being uh, consumed today and, therefore, an even greater quantity uh, in the future. Uh, for that matter, uh, it's quite logical that a um, uh, producer today would charge a price like P4 because by charging price P4, they would sell, uh, say, Q6, uh, and that can stimulate an even greater demand out here uh, in the future. Uh, notice that uh, what we have here is a case in which the long-run uh, demand curve uh, is more elastic uh, than the uh, short-run uh, demand curve. And the reason is that you, you have the network uh, uh, effects uh, uh, kicking in. Now, what makes it interesting is that uh, as the price goes down, the demand goes up, and it may very well be that the producer who lowers the price aggressively up front can, in fact, achieve uh, some sort of dominance in, in the market uh, in the future. And when the price, uh, when the firm achieves dominance in the future, then it can indeed maybe act like a, uh, a, uh, a monopolist, in which case it can uh, achieve monopoly profits. Well, that doesn't necessarily mean that consumers are worse off. Why? Because if a firm can achieve monopoly profits in, in the future, it has an even greater uh, interest in uh, lowering the price uh, today. It may even lower the price below uh, P4. Uh, Why? Because that can stimulate demand, it can increase uh, dominance, it can cause the market to tip, as some uh, theorists have, have suggested, and as a result, uh, they can achieve uh, uh, monopoly profits in the future. The moral of the story is, is that monopoly profits in the future can cause a suppressed price uh, uh, today. What we have shown uh, to this point is that uh, network effects makes the long-run demand curve uh, more elastic than the short-run demand curve, no matter how elastic uh, the short-run curves are. Uh, it follows that the greater, the stronger the uh, network effects, the more elastic uh, the long-run curve. Return to our graph. Here, let's suppose that when we lower the price from P1 uh, to P2, instead of the uh, demand curve going out to D2 uh, because of network effects, suppose that the demand curve goes all the way out uh, to D3 uh, as a consequence. Well, in that case, then the network effects uh, causes the demand curve to have an elasticity that looks something like, like this. That is, uh, the demand curve moves in this direction. That is, it has an even greater elasticity uh, of, of demand. And as a consequence, this, this curve would mean that uh, producers would have an even stronger um, incentive to lower the price uh, up, up front. Uh, the moral of the story is that um, uh, network effects are very important in, in a, a firm's pricing a strategy. The, longer, the stronger the, the network effects, the more likely the firm is going to suppress its price up front. The more likely it's going to charge a zero price, the more likely it might even pay uh, consumers um, uh, up front uh, to try their, their product. Thank you very much for being with us.